Hey, everybody, and thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I was just telling the organizers that I've never been to Oklahoma, and this is the closest I've gotten. So this is pretty exciting. Hopefully, I can make it all the way there next year. But I'm happy to be where we are. Welcome to my talk, The Pony Express and How Technology Moves Fast. Before I get started, of course, I want to thank all of the organizers, uh, especially Emily for, for getting me involved and, and for reaching out and all of the work that everyone's doing behind the scenes, Max and Doji and everybody. Thank you so much because without you, none of this would work out. So that was about you. How about a little bit about me? So as mentioned, my name is PJ Haggerty. I've been a developer since I was a teenager, which is a long time ago. Um, I, I hail from Buffalo, New York. You probably know one or two things about Buffalo, New York. One, our professional sports teams are absolutely terrible and always lose. And two, we invented chicken wings. They are called chicken wings, not buffalo wings. Some of you might say, oh, buffalo wings, that's why. Educational. Um, I'm also a dad. I've been married for over 20 years. Um, I was a hockey coach for a while. I play in bands. Um, I do karaoke and lots of silly things, especially when conferences were in real life. Um, and I also once helped my daughter to keynote the, uh, one of the largest uh, largest um, Ruby conferences in the entire world, which is RubyConf. She did that when she was 11. She's 19 now. Feel free to look at that whenever you feel the need to see how bad I can possibly do on stage. Um, also, never go on stage with an 11-year-old. little personal advice there. I also work at a place called Mattermost. Uh, Mattermost is a really cool option for... Um, safe, secure collaboration online. Um, the simplest way to explain Mattermost is we are an open source alternative to Slack, which means you kind of have something going on in Slack, but you could actually do it open source behind a firewall, on-prem, or in the cloud. It's all kinds of optimizable, customizable. You can build anything you want and integrate it into Mattermost. So I highly recommend checking it out because it is an awesome, awesome platform. But and we will talk a little bit more about that during the talk, but that is not really the main thrust of why we're here. So you probably saw the catchy title and thought, hmm, something's going to go on here. And I don't know exactly what's going to go on here, but it should be pretty exciting. We'll see what happens. So I'm going to start with a history lesson. I'm sure a lot of you watch movies, look at TV, read books. And a lot of people who watch Westerns or modern takes on the romantic American Western movement believe in certain things. The good guys always wore white hats and they always won the day. Everything west of the Mississippi was lawless. Some bank robbers weren't such bad people. And the Pony Express was how mail got delivered. To many people, these are facts. Irrefutable. Unbelievable. There's, there's no way you could ever say that that is not true. These are dearly held beliefs that have been allowed, excuse me, allowed to become the stories that we build other stories on. I mean, how many Westerns do you watch where at some point in time a Pony Express rider just rides into town and is like, got the mail here, sir. Um, Western Union telegram. But if you start to look closely, there's some holes in the story and there's some really big ones. So let's start to understand the history. So before even the Civil War, some folks decided to head out West to seek their fortunes. The United States was trying to achieve a goal called Manifest Destiny. We all remember that from high school history class, expanding from East Coast to West Coast, fully across the continent. For some people, this meant opportunity, be it to find farmland, to establish new freedoms that they hadn't experienced anywhere else, maybe to find gold lying in the hills across America. And when that happened, when prospectors found gold on the California coast, towns began to pop up all along it. It was necessary for people, but and companies who own the land or paid prospectors and families of these adventurous souls, they needed to get their mail as quickly as possible. These remote locations were growing and fast. Between 1848 and 1860, the population of California grew to 380,000 people. That doesn't sound like a lot right now, but when you consider that in 1848, the population was about 1,500 people, that's a lot in 12 years. With very few ways to get information from one end of the country, to the other, we had to find a new solution. So some of you are like saying, well, what about the railroad, PJ? And that's a great question. Well, railroads could get messages a good portion of the way across the continent. They couldn't make it much farther than Missouri. When the United States gained New Mexico and Arizona states in 1853, we could only just start to consider bringing the coast together via rail. On the north side of things, things were too hilly. They were too mountainous. We couldn't get a train through them. But once we had those kind of desert plateaus, we were able to kind of push through. 1853, that took a long time. But let's be honest. The railroad back then was no guarantee of speed or safety. 
It was kind of like having, I don't know, a server in a closet being maintained by someone with a general idea of how to run Linux or Ubuntu and making their own Cat5 cables with one of those little slicer crimpers that we used to have back in the day, all of which were entwined in extremely unsafe ways through this closet that had no ventilation. Sound familiar? Unsafe, unstable. In the case of the trains prone to robbery, the railroad could not be the right answer for this growing country. Then we kind of have to add to these aggravating edge cases and these issues that are popping up. People are very far away. The railroad can't do it. And then there's this small inconvenience of who exactly was doing all the work. So a lot of people wanted to bring the country together, but others kind of wanted to remain on top of the pile. And they wanted to do that by oppressing other human beings, which is kind of very, 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 very wrong. War was on the horizon. If we wanted to continue to be successful and to move forward as a country, we needed a way to communicate quickly. On the eve of the American Civil War, the Pony Express was born. This is a very exciting moment. A network was built. This is easily understandable to all of us. We've worked within networks and we're all working remotely now. We know what a network is. In the case of the Pony Express, this network was built of riders, generally extremely young, sometimes orphans, sometimes escaped slaves, and they would be hired to ride like the wind. The Pony Express began its ride on April 30th, 1860. Suddenly, you could get a message from New York City to San Francisco in just 10 days. It sounds horrible, but this was a miracle of modern communications. If we learned anything from the movies about the Pony Express, it's about how ubiquitous and long-lasting it was. It seems like every Western has some reference to the Pony Express. There's been movies and television shows dedicated to Brave Riders, their horses, Flying across the plains, outwitting dangerous animals, bandits, and Native Americans who were kind of upset that we kept taking their land and territories. Rightfully so. The Pony Express, a paragon of in innovation in April 1860. However, this amazing and great technique for moving messages coast to coast was outdated after a mere year and a half, 18 months. The needs of the people and the speed of technology overtook the Western riders. So instead of innovation, the Pony Express was really just a stopgap method. Um, and who, and it probably would have remained a footnote in American history were it not for the so-called Penny Dreadfuls that raised Pony Express riders to these heroic levels. They were heroes. They had huge status. They were influencers. Wink, wink. I think you see what I'm getting at. Um, a simple device at the right time a time when war was starting and communication needed to move faster than ever before. All this culminated in the end of the Pony Express after 18 months of operation. As a side note, this little device, this picture that you see here, the telegraph, think about this the next time you have a conversation about machines replacing people. Automation is not a new issue. The telegraph replaced Pony Express riders. riders. And the next time you're out and about and you're in a building, and you hop in an elevator, look around and see if you can figure out where the elevator operator is and how to give them a tip. Automation's not new. We need to stop thinking, thinking of it that way. The idea is automation frees us up to do things better, theoretically. That's a whole philosophical discussion for some other talk and not this one. So if the Pony Express was a stopgap, how long did the telegraph last? Funny you should ask. Um, perhaps you've heard of a British person sometimes called the father of modern computer science. Um, in World War II, so about 80 years after the Civil War, Alan Turing was in England trying to decipher telegraph messages that were encoded using the above machine. This is called an Enigma machine. Um, it was a way to encrypt and decrypt messages sent via telegraph. I have a whole other talk about, um, about Turing and how exactly the Enigma works, and it, it's great, and you could look at it some other time, but that's not what we're here to talk about. The idea here is that some pieces of technology last a long time, Others fade quickly or have limited use and disappear. We see this all the time in the application development world. Unless all of you plan to share your thoughts of this talk on your Bebo page or your live journal, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so let's take a look at some of the things and see their lasting power. And maybe we can start to speculate on what has staying power like the telegraph was more of a flash in the pan, which by the way, for the etymology and English majors out there, that is literally an 1849 gold prospecting reference. So every time you hear the term flash in the pan, think about those folks who are out there actually digging for gold and looking for that flash in the pan. That's where the idea comes from because it's so quick, you might miss it. 
Um, so we'll start with a brief philosophy lesson, which is exactly what everyone's hoping for is the last talk of the day. I know. Calm down. I can hear the cheers all the way here in Buffalo. Um, philosophies around technology are not a new phenomenon. Whether it's ideas that mainframe computing is the only true computer science solution to the idea that DevOps can be certified and assigned as a team. There have never been a shortage of ideologies that accompany the work we do. Most philosophies are really meant as a set of best practices to allow us to work more and flow more easily, produce better applications or run better networks or better data centers on the earth, in the cloud, behind firewalls, wherever. That's kind of the idea. Some are only suggestions because something worked on my machine, so it must work for everyone else. So let's take a look at some common modern era philosophies, see where the strengths and the pitfalls might be. Uh, waterfall. This is near my house. Not near my house, but it's like close. This is Niagara Falls. Waterfall is probably one of the most well-known and much maligned development methods in the world today. Show of, I mean, I don't know how we're going to show hands. If you want to just jump into Slack and like, feel free to raise your hand or wave at me. How many of you have been involved in an organization that uses or is using or used at some point in time the waterfall technique? For those of you that don't know what that is, because there's some young people out there that may not have this lovely experience. This is the literal definition of waterfall. The waterfall model is a relatively linear sequential design approach for certain areas of engineering design. In software development, it tends to be among the less iterative and flexible approaches as progress flows in largely one direction, downwards like a waterfall, through the phases of conception, initiation, analysis, design, construction, testing, deployment, and maintenance. Whew, that's a good one. Pretty thorough for an idea that was first developed in, anyone? The 1950s. A mere 10 years or so after Turing was dealing with the telegraph, we're trying to find computer engineering techniques in computer science. Innovative for a time, this time, though shortly afterwards, people pretty much saw the flaws. Waterfall is simple. No one can argue that. I would just like to thank, thank Doji for singing TLC in the chat, in Slack. I appreciate you. Um, so as our programming teams began to build applications for business and scientific inquiry, we need to establish how to do this in like an organized way. How are we gonna build things and have an organization that makes sense? So is it in any way, any way, that it was surprising that our first thought was to take a page from modern manufacturing techniques at the time. To build a car, you establish requirements. You design it using said requirements. You build the car. You test to see if it works. Maybe you do some maintenance when it's out in the real world, but once it's out in the real world, like what, what are you going to do? Easy, right? Why wouldn't software work in exactly the same way? So the problem with this philosophy, like so many first ideas, like the Pony Express, is short-sightedness. What works in one industry does not necessarily work for another. And here's another great example. Uh, if you're looking at this picture now, what you're looking at is in Niagara, is Niagara Falls, again, where they decided to stop it and put in, uh, I believe it was steel rods or iron rods in an attempt to prevent the erosion from continuing. You can see at the bottom, there's all those rocks and it's extremely dangerous to go over the falls. And I don't know why people keep trying to do it, but that's none of my business. So they actually stopped the falls, backed it up and drove things, drove these rods into it. And that did not work out so well. Um, because then we had steel rods sticking out of it. And this was like in the 60s, so they took it out. But that works when you're generally doing cement or stone work. So why wouldn't it work when you're working with a waterfall? Because the situation is not the same. You can't take something and slap it in and think it's going to work. So in a few minutes, we're going to discuss the agile philosophy, much of which focus on the concept of lean, an idea brought over from Japanese car manufacturing. Now, it seems like you're saying, PJ, waterfall was from car manufacturing and agile and leaner from car manufacturing, didn't we learn anything? But there's a difference. And it's in how these ideas were adopted. For agile, we borrow. With waterfall, we just took the whole thing and ran with it. Waterfall has no iteration, has no feedback loop. There is no structure for movement outside of the specs. Most people know when an organization is not flexible, that spells doom, huge red flags, massive alarm bells. Waterfall was a doom philosophy before it got off the ground. Yet, parts of it are still in use today in large-scale corporations. And a little side note I want to add. 
when I say large scale corporations, understand I'm not just talking about tech companies. I'm not saying, well, IBM and Google move slowly because they're large scale. Every company right now is a tech company. There is no company out there unless you are like maybe selling something at a farmer's market, but even then you're using Venmo. Technology is involved in every single thing that we do, every aspect of our life. There's no point in saying that a company is not a tech company. Everyone needs tech. But I digress. Let's talk about Agile a little bit. So Agile is more modern, more widely accepted philosophy, especially now in the world of tech. And the word conjures up images that may or may not work along with the ideals of the philosophy. So let's define it before we make any decisions on how we feel about it. Agile is an approach to software development under which requirements and solutions evolve through the collaborative effort of self-organizing and cross-functional teams and their customers or end users. It advocates adaptive planning, evolutionary development, early delivery, and continual improvement, and it encourages rapid and flexible response to change. That sounds awesome! Oh my God, so amazing. This is so much better than Waterfill. Self-organizing teams, Area of development, customer input, what could go wrong? So I had this conversation with this dude, Martin Fowler, Fowler who had to happen to write the Agile Manifesto. It's a space age solution. Everything that we are looking at here is great. Iteration, collaboration, flexibility. At the advent of Agile, which was, believe it or not, the 1970s, there still wasn't a need for adherence to a software development philosophy. Most software was still built in and for large-scale corporations. Computers weren't common in homes, and even entertainment systems like ColecoVision and Atari were only coming into being a thing. Agile was a sleepy philosophy for a while. Then, as more modern application development and deployment grew in the 90s, began to take off. We see Martin develop the Agile Manifesto, and people really start to adhere to it. We couldn't just apply normal manufacturing techniques to building and deploying software. It didn't work. We need real world ways that apply to the problem at hand. Something modern, something different. Agile is an amazing modern workflow with a few caveats. And where they come in is really the peripherals. Things like Scrum, Kanban, Shira. The add-ons that aren't really necessary and don't really contribute to the success of the team. Agile means flexible. If your team can work without the overhead of complicated necessity like daily stand-ups and raft teams, Agile will probably work for you. As with any philosophy, your mileage may vary. Zealotry and strict adherence stagnates growth. If you need to file rules as strictly as possible, that's not very flexible, <clears throat> not very Agile. As a great bonus, though, Agile led us to something new, DevOps. So DevOps... We're going to do it again. Here's another definition. Are you ready? It's about to come. It's coming at you fast. DevOps is a set of software development practices that combine software development, dev, and information technology operations, ops, to shorten the system's development life cycle while delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close alignment with business objectives. Different disciplines can collaborate, making quality everyone's job. Personally, I love this definition. It's amazing. It's really what the other philosophies are striving for as far as how a tech team should function. All the best parts of Agile, a few of the good ideas from Waterfall, applied to all the teams across an organization. Everyone is part of the conversation. Everyone is responsible. This is our modern answer to how best deliver software. Mobile, web, OSs, doesn't matter. We've learned from the past, and this is what we have. Um, DevOps, according to some, should be the end-all be-all of development. Kind of like Kubernetes is the only way to deploy an application. And if you don't believe me, then you just don't deserve to be working with computers anymore. You should stop. Um, that was sarcasm. Please note the sarcasm. I have real problems with Kubernetes. Uh, we understand the concepts of inter interaction with developers and ops or IT. We add to that the folks from QA. We have a great testing cycle. And what do we focus on? We focus on automation. DevOps goals, according to some folks, is to automate as much as possible to remove risk. I mean, isn't that really what happened to the Pony Express? Huge risk, uh, getting, getting scalped is kind of a huge risk, uh, getting murdered so someone could steal the mail, kind of a huge risk. No one can do that to the telegraph. We needed to move messages faster. So instead of doing it manually on horseback, we automated it. We built a system that made the old system less useful. Makes one wonder if part of the point of DevOps is to make DevOps unnecessary. So like all great theories, DevOps is a great theory. Everyone works happily together now because we're employing DevOps, right? 
all problems are resolved. We all get along and the world is at peace and applications work perfectly. DevOps, it works 60% of the time, every time. Like Waterfall and Agile before it, before it, DevOps has one major downfall and it's based on the whole perfect world idea. That's the problem. In a perfect world, all these things work. In a perfect world, we don't have to worry about how, how people function together, but people are what generally create the problems. When faced with the reality of organizations functioning at modern speed, some of these things start to fall down. Now, this doesn't mean that we should abandon hope all ye who DevOps, but we need to see where these philosophies work and where they don't. We need to take our organization's perspective into account to achieve our goals. Not DevOps where I work isn't gonna look like DevOps where you work, and that's okay. That's kind of part of the point. We need to be critical of the things we do and find the parts that don't work. All things in tech should be constant evolution, not an end goal. Uh, Doji and I were talking about this before. If you think that there's a point where your software is done, you're not doing it right. We're never done. So before like, we have those methodologies and those philosophies, so what about like the infrastructure of how our teams work? We need to build things, whether in ops or dev, these ideas come to, come to pass. So let's talk about some other philosophies. We'll start with test-driven development. This is a concept that everything you build, software or hardware, application or infrastructure, database, doesn't matter, must be thoroughly tested before going out into the world. Great idea, except that it takes nearly twice as long to build literally anything. Additionally, since you never really know how people will use a thing out what's out in the world, it can be needlessly pedantic. So maybe we replace that with behavior-driven development? Unlike test-driven development, behavior-driven development is based on how users interact with and break the things we do. Forward thinking, right? Let's see how users do things and build what we need based on that information. Brilliant. Less time than TDD, right? Mm, theoretically, maybe. But it also leaves a huge possibility of failing and falling over again and again. Luckily, the BDD movement, DevOps culture has been able to kind of adapt and adopt the concepts using things like chaos engineering to see how things will actually function in the real world and make systems more resilient. And this is great and behavior based. So even like out of the, excuse me, out of misguided philosophies, we can we can pull some good parts out. That's, that's awesome. Let's talk about what we really do. What really goes on in the world, in every organization, in every team, is what I like to call shame-driven development. People only write as many tests as they can get away with so the next developer doesn't think they skipped it all together. The ops person only takes their time setting up physical hardware so it seems their time was worth what they want it to be worth. The SRE only holds everything together with duct tape and bubble gum, but documents a well-running system. This isn't lying. This is just shame-driven development. Whether DevOps or Agile or what have you, we generally build things so we won't be shamed by the next person who sees it. This is the truth where most things in life, in the world of tech today, this is where they live. Kind of like how the Pony Express was built good enough for what the United States needed at the time. We innovate, but often we focus on what, like you know, I'm sure everybody's heard this term, minimal viable product, minimal viable setup. And focus on those two words, minimal and viable. E. That doesn't actually sound good. So even just the language that we develop and comes with philosophies and ideals that matter to some, but seem to be less important as time marches on. Compiled languages versus non-compiled, open source versus enterprise. I always land on open source. But I mean, enterprise languages, and by that I mean like C++ or .NET. We're seeing now a return to functional programming practices while also seeing the growth of JavaScript as the absolute end all be all of everything that we need for single page web applications. So these choices, they lead to things that are not like, you know, like not leading a proper server, deploying to a, a GitHub page with like Jekyll, Jekyll or Middleman or Gatsby or whatever. Um, so you don't, you don't even need like an ops team, right? Like that's possible. But these aren't innovations so much as like iterations on the same circle of concepts. We aren't really building new things. We're just solving the same problem in different ways. And that's okay. That leads to innovation sometimes. Then you have like a lot of these other things. These are all concepts. They're ideas. But a lot of them are based on the idea of, of others. Like what's it like to truly innovate? How do you change an industry that's been moving in a certain direction with a certain momentum for so long? Um, when I first started DevRelate, uh, the process took two years to consider and seven years of experience before I ever even thought about it. We're the first developer in community relations as a service company. 
Now there's a handful of companies that do it. So like we were able to innovate, but now there's other people building on the same model. I won't say they're the same, but like they're competing in the same space. It's the same at Mattermost. Mattermost started as a video game company. Then they decided that they needed to change a little bit. They needed to build something. So they actually took their, the, the speech pattern, the, the communication chat thing that they were doing that was very successful and made that into a completely open source product. Now we have like a whole bunch of tools like playbooks for your DevOps teams. And we have um, focal board for keeping track of things, which is like an open source Trello or something along those lines. We continue to innovate and find new ways to fix things. The most interesting thing about most of innovation that we hear about is and see is that it's about technology. The Pony Express was about technology, kind of. It's like using the resources that we had available to complete a task. That's what technology is. Also, it's clear that the Pony Express was a bubble just like there's a startup board, one that burst quite spectacularly. We hear this term in tech and investment fairly regularly. The bubble, will it burst? Are we safe? It's hard to tell. We don't know. We know last time VC-backed firms feared very poorly while bootstrap companies survived for the most part. What does that mean? I don't. It doesn't mean anything. Tech is one place where history doesn't necessarily repeat itself. Will the new bubble, bubble burst? I don't know. It's hard to tell. But it seems that we may have learned from last time and hopefully we know how to keep our heads above water if things start going south. The issue, however, isn't only resiliency through a bubble burst or playing it safe so that we can make sure to rake in the cash with our investments. The issue is innovation. We need to continue to push, push forward. And I hate to say that, but it works. Like we need to ugh, disrupt industries as often as possible to ensure we innovate. We can't stop. We won't stop. I know, Emily, you feel called out, but here's, here's my other MVP. We need to stop making minimal viable products and work on minimal valuable products. What are the things that we build that actually help the people that we're trying to reach? A lot of companies say they're building the things they build in order to see a better world, but they can't even define what that means if you really ask them. Maybe it's some, from, for some of them, it's, it's personal, but it's like not expressed properly. For me, I'd like to see a world with equitable pay for everyone, where people who aren't white males who wear hats and have beards can innovate and build awesome things without worry about being looked at as different or less than. I want to see a tech landscape that is vibrant with ideas. And I'll use my platform to do as much as I can to make that happen, but it kind of needs to be a group effort. We all need to do it together. And that's just one form of innovation. You see, we don't innovate if everyone's not involved. This isn't like you know the robber barons of the, the railroad back in the day. We all work together to make the world that we want to see. That's how we innovate the tech space. That's how we innovate the products we build. You need to ask, what is your motivation to innovate? How do you find that and how do you do it? We strive to keep moving forward. We might be the, the current Pony Express, Pony Express. I mean, will we last longer? Will we become the telegraph of this generation? We don't know. When we think of the word innovation, we think of building something new, discovering some new territory. Uh, we've done that by bringing toward, together, you know, bringing teams together towards a common goal. DevOps takes us a step further by getting rid of those accoutrements of agile, all the rules and saying, hey, we all have the same goal. Let's work together to reach it. That's innovation. That's writing to outlast the competition. Technology moves fast. We need to learn, adapt, and innovate if we hope to keep up. So we see things come and go. We see innovation built on failure. We see philosophies grow from simple adopted ideas, concept borrowed from somewhere else, then retrofitted to our needs. We see what was the best solution today might be outdated tomorrow, and that's okay. We don't need to hold on to these things. When adopting things like DevOps culture and ideals and finding the proper fit, we seek to find the best solution for our teams and our development and our ops environments. We should never accept these ideas blindly. <clears throat> we have to question every step of the way. At some point, there was a young man on the back of a horse racing across the hills of California to deliver a message. He never read it. That wasn't his job. And let's be honest, chances are he probably couldn't even read. His job was to deliver. That message read, telegraph service reaches San Francisco, Pony Express retired. Every point of our job is to innovate and build. We continue to do so knowing that is our future goal, not the nearby goal. We build the minimal valuable product that gets the next iteration, the next team, the next group of people to push that even more further. If the Pony Express was able to do that, maybe they'd still be around today. Probably not, but maybe they would. 
And maybe a lot of the technology that we've seen come and go would also be around. But for now, we can only try to innovate ourselves, our communities, and the people around us to make sure that we can see that better world that we're all envisioning so often. And with that, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to host my own QA because that's innovative, folks, and that's the whole point. Um, so there were some questions that were in the Slack, and I'm going to go ahead and answer them. Um, first of all, uh, Doji had the question, and I'll, I'll just read it straight up. One thing that gets heavily preached and pushed in organizations is the concept of the three-week sprint. However, you might be able to get something to production in two days, or it might take four months. How would you bring this up with scrum masters and leadership, and how can development teams get flexibility instead of being pigeonholed into three-week sprints? Great question, Doji. I, I actually really like this question because this is exactly what's wrong with Agile. Um, the whole idea that we need to wait and we need to have builds done at specific times, or you know, it needs to take X number of days, and then we push every time Friday at 5 o'clock which is terrible, don't do that. Um, but it, it's kind of ridiculous. Like I, I think that the way to kind of work with this is to go to a scrum master and say, listen, you're a scrum master, so you understand the agile philosophy. Theoretically, they should say yes. Uh, in saying yes, you should say, then you should understand that agile means that we are able to move at different speeds, that we are able to get something out for two days. And if, it, if it's going to take four months, sure, we could break it up into smaller pieces, but you're not going to have a finished product for four months. Um, I think that if a scrum master is properly trained and leadership understands that that's the goal, then they should be able to be more flexible and say, have uh, what we might call micro deploys, where, you know, this, the thing that you fixed in two days, because maybe it was like a little bug or a feature that, you know, changing the color to light blue instead of lightest blue. I'm not good with colors. I'm a terrible person on colors, but... Um, like it's a small change. You should be able to micro deploy. And the example that I always use and feel free to bring this up is uh, I'll see if I can find the actual presentation, but there, I saw a presentation from a gentleman at Etsy where they talked about how they deploy up to 50 times a day, a day, even though they are agile, even though they're working, everyone has access to the build system. And to be honest, if, if you're using modern systems with CI, CD, and you're making sure that everything works and tests are going together, things are merged properly before they get deployed, there's no reason why you can't deploy as soon as you finish something, whether that be two days or four months or three weeks or whatever. So I would talk to your scrum master or your your you know your manager or whoever's in charge of this making these decisions and explain to them that there's better ways to do it. And if we want to be flexible, then we need to build that into our systems and not say three weeks or whatever it is, three weeks is just the example, is three weeks or nothing, because that doesn't that doesn't add up to being an agile team. Um, let's see, Emily says, is a minimal viable product okay as long as it's temporary? MVP to get through the trudge for a bit, then innovate from there. Okay, so I see, I think I know where you're going with this question, Emily. Um, and part of it is, yes, you, you, you kind of build a minimal viable product uh, to say like, hey, here's my proof of concept or here's you know the way I think it's going to work. Um, and that's that's perfect. That's exactly what you wanna do. There's nothing wrong with that. What Where the issue comes is, in is a lot of companies make a minimal viable product and that's all there is. Um, they don't really iterate except to find new ways of finding revenue streams off the original MVP. Um, or they pivot and start making video, I don't know. Um, so yeah, like there's nothing wrong with saying as long as it's temporary and MVP is perfectly, perfectly logical. Um, because as I as I mentioned in the, in, in the presentation, and I think that it's, a, it's appropriate to say pretty much anytime, software never gets done. And if you're striving for perfection, like never go for a minimal perfect product, that's not a thing. Um, but when I say minimal valuable product, what is the least thing that adds value to your customer base or to the people who are using it? And I think that's the key. So yeah, MVP, as long as it's temporary, not, not, not a problem. Hey, PJ. Howdy. Hi, PJ. I'm here for Q&A, but I hear you're running with it on your own. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's, it's totally okay. I'm, 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 I'm down with this. Thanks for all with that. I had to commute home. And so now we're, I'm back back here uh we'll let you i saw there was one more question if you want to take it for yourself 
Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was about uh, the one from David. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, was... well, yeah, there's a couple of questions from David. I'm going to ask on the non-technical one first. Okay, go for uh, it. Was I upset Firefly was canceled? This might be the most complicated question that I could possibly be asked. Um, one, yes. Initially, I was super upset about it. Um, I had never seen a show that had combined such seemingly disparate, disparate topics as like, you know, psychic, you know, super sci-fi abilities and you're in space, but also cowboys, but also like some weird government political stuff. And it's kind of punk rock. And how do we handle the way that we treat sex workers? And should we respect people? And women are more powerful than men. Like there were so many things at play that we got out of 13, 14 episodes. I was super upset when it was canceled. Looking back, I would not want Firefly to come back. It was great to have the, sh the show. It was great to have Serenity. These are wonderful things. Unfortunately, we did recently find out that Joss Whedon is like one of the worst people on earth, which kind of sucks um, because I really looked up to him as, as, as a good person. It's disappointing. But I also think that you're never going to rekindle that magic. So while I was upset that it was canceled, I accept that it is a moment in time that we can look back, back upon fondly and move on with our lives. So now to your serious question. Do you believe a merging of development ideologies like combining Agile and DevOps is viable or is just heavy dependent on product? No, I, I don't think it's heavily dependent on product. I, I think it's not only viable, but that's also 100% the idea of DevOps. DevOps is not a solution that can function on its own. Um, in, in a lot of ways, I think of DevOps as kind of like Agile's like little cousin, like little buddy, like, hey, like Agile's cool and everything, like every, we all love Agile, but yo, you know, the cousin's a little bit younger, but also very cool. Um, and, you know, you, we can adopt the things that we need. And and, and as I said, it, it, it's less heavily dependent on product than it is dependent on organization. Um, I know organizations that are six people that use DevOps as if they're a 100 person organization. And I know 100, you know, 150,000 person people organizations that are using Waterfall uh, and it works for them. I don't know, excuse me, I don't know how or why, but it seems to work and that's okay. That's okay. None of these, uh, none, they're, they're, I've yet to see the piece of technology or the, the technology philosophy that has come out. This has made me say, Boom, we got this golden solution now. The golden hammer has been dropped. We 100% don't have to do everything, anything else. We can stop innovating on the things that we do because we've got, I don't know, Ember.js. And that's going to solve all of our problems from here on out. Ember.js on a serverless Lambda on AWS. The rest of our application is served by a Kubernetes cluster. We're good. We're golden. There's nothing, what else? All we have to do is sit back and collect the cash, everyone. It doesn't, it just, it just doesn't work that way. Everybody's working towards a different goal. Everyone's building a different product, even if in the, they're in the same space, everyone iterates differently. And so I don't think that, you know, it's so heavily dependent on product, but it is definitely dependent on how you organize your people. And I think that's it. There's nothing more permanent than a temporary hack, Kyle Simpson. Thank you, Jacrese Keith. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, but you're 100% correct. Um, I actually had a conversation with uh, a person that I worked with in, I left the job in 2011. I talked to them like three weeks ago. And they talked about how a hack that I had done in a piece of academic software was still there because to get rid of it would actually take down the entire connection to the database. And I was like, that's right. That temporary hack is the most permanent thing I've ever built in my life. So it's, it's always interesting to see. Always interesting to see. I feel like that was the, it'll happen to you, said the old guy standing at the microphone. I, I think so. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, PJ, thank you, one, for closing out the conference, but also for doing your own q and I really appreciate that. Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. I'm all about community. Communities work together. That's what it's all about. Yeah, you asked yourself questions, and they answered them great. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, nothing like self moderate <laughs> Um, all right, well, we're going to close out the conference. Uh, again, uh, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they have follow-up questions? Yeah, I'm super easy to find. It's pj.haggerty at mattermost.com, or you can find me on Twitter at Asplenic. That's A-S-P-L-E-E-N-I-C. 
um, because I lost my spleen when I was 19. I'm ha- if you want to DM me, I'm happy to tell you that story. It's not as exciting as you think it is. Well, thank you and have a great weekend. We appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks everybody for having me. It's been awesome.